Well, hello and welcome to the eighth in the series, Fearless Conversations, which is a collaboration between The Advertiser and Flinders University. This is a series about being brave in our thinking, about how we drive South Australia forward in the future and about the challenges that we face to make this great state a success. It's a, a, there's been a series of fearless discussion panels uh, over a 13 week period. And as I say, this is the eighth in those. We've looked at all sorts of topics, things like the environment, digital health and technology, defense, transport and infrastructure. And there's more to come. These are all hot topics that are very much the uh, areas that will determine what happens next in South Australia. We've got leaders in each of these sectors have joined us to share their thoughts on what are the opportunities and challenges that we face together as a state and them individually within their own industries. Today we're looking at uh, education, which of course is uh, an absolutely crucial sector. It basically underpins everything else, as well as offering opportunities in its own right. Please, you're welcome to join the conversation, um, ask questions and make comments via the Twitter handle, hashtag fearless conversations, or you can uh, make comments and uh, ask questions via the advertiser website. Um, look for it there and Put your comment in there. Now thanks uh, for joining us today in Fearless Conversations. I'm Chris Russell, I'm the education reporter at The Advertiser and The Sunday Mail and I'll be facilitating today's uh, discussion. Now before I introduce the uh, panelists, I would like to acknowledge that we are meeting today on the traditional lands of the Ghana people of the Adelaide Plains and we pay respect to their elders past and present. We recognize and respect their cultural heritage, beliefs and relationships with the land. We acknowledge that they are of continuing importance to the Guyana people living today. And we also extend that respect to other Aboriginal and Indigenous language groups and other First Nations peoples. So a very exciting panel that we have with us today. On the far side, we have uh, Wendy Johnson, who is the uh, principal of Glenanga International High School. Um, who's been there now for some time, but she's had a lot of experience in other schools um, across a range of socioeconomic groupings. In the middle, we have Colin Sterling, who is the Vice Chancellor uh, of Flinders University and uh, comes from a background of being a geneticist. And uh, next to me, we have uh, Karen Kent, who is the Chief Executive of Study Adelaide. Study Adelaide is the, uh, the prime body which uh, promotes um, international student uh, recruitment and uh, looks after the students while they're here across the board, universities, other tertiary education institutions and schools. So as I say, please uh, feel free to join in with the uh, hashtag Fearless Conversations. Now, one of the things that uh, one finds in education is there's, there's a certain amount of resistance uh, from the public. When we write stories uh, in the advertiser or when the conversation comes up, they, they, there is often some sort of criticism about whether students are coming out of schools fully equipped, are they able to read and write properly or certainly as well as they used to be able to do. And uh, students coming out of universities having studied something obscure or, or degree that, uh, such as law, where lots and lots of people have come out and there are no jobs. So I wanted to just explore that um, firstly with Wendy in terms of whether um, there is any validity to those sorts of criticisms and, uh, and where she thinks, where the panelists think that kind of, um, that attitude is coming from. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. Um, I think it's one of those urban myths that our young people can't read and write. I think there's some truth in terms of the fact that over the past decade or so, we've dropped the ball uh, in terms of primary schools, uh, in terms of how we teach reading and uh, writing and numeracy. But we're certainly currently working intensely on that because we know if our students can actually read and write successfully by the time they finish year three, that they're going to have a much more successful education. But what we know in terms of reality is that our young people are far better equipped than they've ever been. If you think about the fact that um, an adolescent holds in their hand a smartphone which has all the information that took man to the moon in the first place, and yet these students are able to manage all of that, 
The challenge for us really in schools is to teach students how to manage the information flow that they're subjected to all the time. We work obviously on ensuring that the basic foundations, reading, writing and numeracy, which enable students to access learning are in place. But then our focus is very much on developing the whole young person to make sure that they can think critically, that they're innovative, that they're creative, all the sorts of things that our employers tell us they want and can see in our young people. And so, what, what happens, uh, the Australia, Australian students, certainly in comparison to, to um, other students in the OECD, seem to have been uh -huh. falling behind. So um, where do think, you, why do you think I that's think been happening? It's a really um, troublesome comparison because our cultures are very different. We're often compared, for example, to Finland, which is a very different culture to uh, Australia and to South Australia. So it's comparing apples with oranges. It is important that our young people can read and write. There's no question about it. And although there's a great deal of controversy about NAPLAN, we find it really useful in terms of diagnosing what we need to teach in terms of dealing with the gaps in young people's education. I think the challenge for us, Chris, is our publicity in terms of why do the public think that our young people can't read and write when they actually can in many cases and where they can't, we're working on that significantly. But why is it that the public don't appreciate the wonderful education that our young people are currently getting and how skilled and articulate our young people currently are that they never were two or three decades ago. Mm. And people coming out of university, Colin, like uh, I'm sure you've heard that criticism. Why am I studying law when there's not going to be a job for me? Or why, why is my, my child studying law when there's not going to be a job for them? So look, I think the, I mean, I think the, the, the concept of an, or, an urban myth, I think is a, is a very real one. You know, I think I went to university in the 1980s and I remember being told then that things weren't as good as they used to be, you know? So I think that the, the concept that education is changing, it's a good thing that we change and update the way mm -hmm. that we teach and the things that we teach. Uh, and then there's this, neg uh, a negative perception can so very easily grow up around it. I mean, in terms of the graduating students uh, for employment, um, clearly it's a very important part of what we, endeavor to do. Um, clearly, we want our graduates to be employable, um, but we don't necessarily, in every instance, in every degree, design the degree and tailor it to a specific job outcome. I mean, clearly, there are some exceptions to that in the professions, in nursing, and medicine. You know, those students, they anticipate working in those particular Very professions. specific skills. Very specific skills. Yeah. But many other elements of, of the, the courses that we deliver are designed to develop the skill sets that then are transferable into different areas. Uh, you mentioned law. Uh, I, uh, I remember sitting once actually in a minister's outer office talking to that minister's um, advisors uh, who were raising the, precisely the same point. Universities train too many lawyers and they can't get jobs in law. And I mentioned that many people with law degrees go on to very exciting roles in other disciplines and other fields mm. and both these advisors and <laughs> both, both of these advisors said oh yes i've got a law degree yeah. <laughs> yeah. you know so th there are huge opportunities that are, are that become available if if we develop those graduates with the right suite of skills uh, and you know look i i certainly don't want to blow flinders university's trumpet you know on, on this occasion but i can't resist mentioning that we did come um, top in the country in the most recent graduate outcomes survey uh, for postgraduate employment outcomes. Uh, so we're doing something right. Uh, that's on ninety-seven percent of our postgraduates mm. uh, are in uh, are in full-time employment. That's that's three years after they they that's completed uh, after full-time employment. Full-time full employment. That's exactly. So, yeah. So that that's you know that that's clearly something that we're very proud of. Mm. Um, have we for every one of them predicted which job they'd go into? No. Because that's not really what education is about. Education is a preparation for then a lifetime of employment. Mm. And in terms of evaluating the students as they come through schools and they're applying to universities, um, the traditional thing has been the, the ATAR mark and the, the quotas for some of the competitive courses and so on. 
but there, there seems to be a bit of change going on. Certainly the SACE board is looking to producing a learner's profile rather than just a, mm -hmm. a SACE certificate, so you get a broader picture. And the, um, the universities seem to be increasingly opening up um, different pathways, different avenues in which you can get into university. Do you think that's a, that's a welcome trend? Is that a, a better indication? Are, they going to, are there better indications of who's going to be successful coming out of school? And to... Well, at Glenunga, we've had a learner profile for every one of our students for the last two years. And the important aspect of a learner profile is it enables uh, future employers, future universities to see the whole student, not just the academic grades of a student. So they can actually see the 21st century skills, creativity, innovation, collaboration, and they can actually see how the student has developed these skills and to see evidence of the student developing those skills. So it enables a university or a future employer to make a much better assessment of a student who's going to be really successful in terms of undertaking a university course, which is after all education for life. We know that if students only do the academics, they end up often not being as successful in terms of the next step of their education. Whereas we know that if students develop a holistic approach to learning and are capable of driving their own learning and taking responsibility for their own learning, they'll be successful at university or employment and thrive in the rest of their life. So for us, a learner profile is absolutely essential. We understand that potentially it means a lot more work for universities, lots more resourcing in terms of admission procedures, but we think the SACE board led by Professor Martin Westwell is on the right track because we think that's how you need to assess 21st century students. And are you tracking what happens with the, the you've had it there for a couple of years, are you tracking whether people are actually employers, universities are actually looking at that and evaluating that rather than just the ATAR score? It's really early days for us, yeah. but that's certainly what we're working on, Chris. Yeah. And but, in terms of pathways, yeah, do you think that um, ATAR is going to be sort of decreasing in importance? I'll, I mean, I think the, you know, there's no single assessment that could ever be perfect in terms of, mm, of predicting an individual's future yeah. success. Um, An ATAR is a moment in time and it's a ranking, um, you know, it, it serves a, a very useful purpose, um, but, you know, I think no one would argue that it was perfect. Um, and therefore, additional insights and information mm -hmm. is immensely valuable. You know, at, at my own university, around half of our intake in first year uh, enter directly um, as graduates of year 12. Mm -hmm. So they come straight from year 12 into the university. The other half um, come maybe two, three, or 20 years later. Mm. Uh, and they come in with a different um, set of, of, of experiences and we can use their different experiences as part of their entry into the university. So we've got lots of different pathways that enable people to, to come in and join us. Uh, but what we then do is we track we track those different cohorts that have come in by different different routes, and we make sure that we're getting the entry standard right um, by virtue of the capacity of those students to then be successful and, and graduate. And, and it's working, like the ones that like, are doing as well as anybody else. Have. Absolutely. So we have we have success rates for alternative pathways that are just as just as uh, successful, sometimes even more so uh, than our base ATAR score. Mm. Now that's looking ahead to this, the future and, and the way you know people have evaluated. But in the very immediate term, the education sector has suffered a very uh, severe blow with the um, COVID travel restrictions and you know the effect that that's had on um, international students coming in um, and so on. So I don't know, Karen. As, as through study, study Adelaide, you've got a, like an umbrella view mm. of the situation. Sort of what's the latest um, feeling in terms of the the overall. Uh, economic impact, jobs impact, and um, you know, where, 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 where are we at at the moment? Yeah, well, there clearly has been an impact, and I guess the data tells us that um, you know the economic value to the state has declined by about two hundred and fifty million between two thousand and nineteen and two thousand and twenty. Um, so that's that pipeline, I guess, is, is something we will we will never get back in terms of the students that we. we Sorry, is that that's two hundred and fifty million a year? 
that was yeah between so it was was above two billion. It was above two billion. That's so right. Two point one billion. We're about one point eight five billion <clears throat> at the end of last year. Uh, it's probably hard to sort of predict where we will. I mean, we we are, we will expect another decline at some point this year. Um, but there are lots of signals about twenty twenty two and and Australia are reopening again, which are very positive. Um, we will start to see, ideally, some students all going well and on track, some students returning hopefully by the end of this year. Um, now, look, the priority for those students will be those that need to complete those placements or uh, complete their qualification. They need to do placements or practicals or an element of their qualification onshore. They will be the priority to come back first, but their very presence here in the city and the state will generate a level of activity and vibrancy because I think that's something that a lot of people comment on that has been missing in the city as well and you know as we start to see uh, things open up in 2022 if, if, if we're on the right track um, we'll see some new students starting to return at some point next year. Now we, we were South Australia there was a handful of students that went to the Northern Territory but the South Australia mm -hmm. was the first to get uh, state to get approval from the federal government uh, for a go ahead, yep. you know, there have been a series of events that have, you know, it's been basically a year now um, that we've had yes. some sort of agreement and even formal agreement more recently, but we st still haven't got a, a, a set date. And we've also got um, Victoria's now got their plans, New South Wales got their plans. So are we at risk of South Australia losing the first mover advantage that we, m we might have had? Look, I think we will be one of the first definitely still one of the first states to start welcoming students back and I think the priority as I said earlier is the individual for us it's and particularly for the universities and, and the schools and the other providers is uh, those helping those students who are part way through their qualification to get back first and foremost so for the individual um, that's that's the imperative is to get those students back for those individuals and you know the signal that it sends to to new and prospective students is going to be very important. Mm. So, um, you know, it's a but very competitive Where context. are the sticking points now? Because it's it's a process that's uh, to the side of, of returning Australians and, and yep. essential travellers. That's right. So it's, a, it's not interfering with media hotels. No. It's not interfering with anything else. That's right. So, so what, what are the, the, the points that are, haven't been resolved that are, are preventing There's just some, the return? Just a few logistical and um, matters that the, the sector is working through. So the sector is now operationalising this and working very closely with the government agencies such as SA Health um, to, to make sure that we're operationalising this in a very safe manner for both the community and also the students returning. So um, so that yeah. what like physical changes to to That's the Parafield absolutely. Uh, so or? there's got to be some operational infrastructure changes out at um, the Parafield, the site that's been selected and approved by SA Health to to um, accommodate these students when they return, um, and that will take you know a number of weeks to 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 set that up. So we you know we, as I said, the sector's working really closely together, um, and there's some real momentum and. and Ideally, we do start seeing those students return by the end of the year. And, and the, the cost, I, I think uh, earlier there was indication that deciding who is going to cover exactly which bit of the cost mm. was, a, was still being negotiated. Has mm. that, that reached some sort of position where it's clear now who's going to pay? Well, the, 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 the cost do sit with the sector and, and there'll, there'll be, I guess, a discussion at some point that the students will have to contribute some as they are for all return programs around Australia or, and that will include flights um, and a contribution to, to the, the quarantine. So, mm. and, and do you think we're going to get chartered planes or is, are we going to rely on commercial airlines coming in just on the regular flights and having a spare seat not needed by anyone else? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think those discussions are actually underway with the airlines at the moment as to what's going to work best, because as I said, ideally we bring in, uh, you know, around 200 students at once into to maximise the capacity at, at um, Parafield. So how we operationalise that with the, you know, the air capacity that's uh, available is something we're working through. Mm. So maybe chartered flights or... Possibly, yep, yeah, that's definitely an option. So, but potentially working with commercial carriers, you know, there's, yeah. there's a lot of different ways to, to, do, to do this, yeah. So the federal minister expects that there will be thousands of students coming back by next year. Do you think that's realistic? Maybe Colin? I so look, I think that, I mean, one thing I would say is, you know, I do think that we've been, it's been um, uh, an extremely important development in the state that the state prioritized the return of international students and did develop and get a, get a plan approved. Um, for various reasons, because of 
outbreaks and further state lockdowns and so forth, then it, it wasn't possible to implement it any earlier. Um, it probably is, you know, hopefully um, soon. Um, I guess though, what I would also add that we need to remember that that plan was developed, as you mentioned, more than a year ago, mm. um, at a time and a point in the pandemic where vaccination hadn't begun, uh, where the when certainly the Delta variant um, wasn't around. Um, the situation was very, very different. We we're facing a, a ongoing uncertainty. And the plan itself does allow for the return of students, and especially, as Karen mentioned, you know, bringing back yeah. those students who, who yet need to complete. Um, but it does have a relatively limited capacity uh, to move students through that facility uh, and will take about a year, I think, to, in the original conception, mm. would take about a year to get three or 4,000 students through. We need to return more like 10,000. So sorry, 4,000 within in a, a year. In a year, right. right. So, and that's because of the original plans around quarantine. Now, we're talking with SA Health around what the quarantine requirements might look like in the future. We also, you know, everyone knows that vaccinations are now more prevalent and much more um, widespread uh, in the Australian uh, population than was the case a year ago. Uh, and we're in a position now where we could bring back double vaccinated Mm. students from um, various countries. And that's a very different proposition. Uh, and I think we need to then look at how quickly we can spin up um, international student returns, because this is, as Karen said, this is the biggest international export earner for mm. South Australia. Uh, and this, this, therefore, is the biggest financial, if you wanted to, you know, reboot the SA economy, you pick the biggest export earner that the state has and you know i know that a lot of people listening to this might say well there's a vice chancellor banging on about how the university needs fee paying students well actually those students all spend far more money outside the university in the local economy mm. than they spend inside the university uh, and local businesses landlords and so forth you know the the cafes the coffee shops the restaurants they're all missing uh, this vibrancy that we had in Adelaide just two years ago. They all they know how much they want it back. Again, it's one of those areas where there's there's a community that you've got to bring on side. Like um, you know, again, when we put a story on on uh, advertiser.com.au and the, the the comments come through, it's just keep them out. We don't need them here. You know, we've got our own people to look after. Why, you know, why do yeah, you think I, that community... I, 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 Chris, I, I, walked, I walked from the train station back to this building in Victoria Square about a week ago, and I was pretty shocked at how many empty storefronts I walked past, mm. right? The city mm, absolutely. is, you know, I mean, I, there are, the economic impact of what we are going through is pretty profound, mm. uh, and we have an opportunity to take one of our biggest uh, industries in this state and to spin that up quickly. And that is something that we ought to be doing. And the challenge for us is how we actually help the kind of uh, general members of the South Australian community to understand that by bringing back in international students, we're actually helping them in South Australia mm. for all the reasons that Colin's just outlined. And I think it's, it's making that connection that's really important so that people understand that international students actually means a thriving South Australian economy, which benefits every South Australian. Much of the attention with the, the question about returning students has been about university students and, mm -hmm. and tertiary, rather than not many people think about the school level. Mm -hmm. uh, but Glenunga, certainly you have a significant number of, of international students? And we have a long history of international yeah. students at Glenunga and it's been really important for us to have international students because it enables our South Australian students to understand better what being a global citizen is. So the friendships that are established between our international students and our South Australian students are really important in terms of broadening South Australians' picture of the world. And we can be very insular 
in South Australia. We have a very comfortable, good life uh, for many of us, even those of us who are not doing so well. It's much better than many parts of the world. And so if we can actually connect our young people with students that have very different experiences, it helps them appreciate what they have here in South Australia, but it also broadens their understanding of what being a global citizen is. And if if students nowadays don't understand what being a global citizen is, they're not getting themselves ready for future employment. We know that future employment is about being able to be employed anywhere in the world and being able to be employed where necessary by global employers. Really important. Our students are really disadvantaged if they don't have that global perspective. And what's, what's the pipeline like? So, I mean, the university students uh, certainly can do a lot of their work, um, you know, if that can begin to study online and mm -hmm. you know in the expectation maybe in a couple of years time they're going to be able to to come here and conduct face to, the face-to-face -face bits that they need um school students I, I don't know like you're not running all your uh classes with an online component now are you because everyone the kids are back in in class a number of our uh department of education schools are running online programs mm -hmm for students that are stuck overseas. Our students have actually been with us for nearly two years and they haven't seen their families in that time in a face-to-face -face setting. So they are really homesick. Yeah. We're really interested in kind of bringing students, but we're also really interested in letting our students be able to go back to see their families and then come back to finish their qualifications, which is really important. But you've got like for next year and 20, you've got new ones coming in? Um, not many at this yeah. stage. And so we're waiting to see what happens in terms of bringing international students back into mm -hmm. South Australia. Because whilst it impacts on universities, it also impacts on schools. Mm -hmm. And if we can have them in the schools here, then the, obviously there's a much greater Absolutely. chance that they will stay Down on and, 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 yeah. and study. And, and Wendy's raised a really good point about um, the, the students and the support that they have needed here in mm -hmm. South Australia. The fact they're missing their families so much. Um, and, you know, the schools have done a fantastic job um, that pro other provide institutions, the, you know, all the English language, the vocational education providers at universities have been so conscious of that support. But, and we've seen some amazing and he heard about some amazing stories of families who have taken in this, these students over the, school, the Christmas holidays last year. Mm. Um, in fact, some of the schools were telling us recently that because the students were here over uh, holiday breaks and not flying home, they've actually created even stronger bonds with their, with their counterparts, their, their Australian counterparts, which has been a wonderful, I guess, um, byproduct of this, you know, really tough time for them. So, mm. And the students, the international students have been very interested in, in regional areas in South Australia and, mm. um, yeah. you know, well, th those areas where we've got chronic shortages, mm. we just can't get medical specialists out to, to go and work in country towns, you know, a lot of teachers, you know, you've got vacant principal positions and Absolutely. leadership positions and, and so on. There are lots of areas where regional towns are suffering, but international students are, are quite interested. Well, this, I mean, skill gaps and, and regional employment is, is clearly a, a critical need. And, um, and look, there has been a, a cross government and industry working group that's been in place this year, which has actually looked at this. And one of the outcomes of that is uh, we've been able to put together um, for meals or field trips for international students out into certain, re with support from those regions, the councils and regional development Australia, to connect them to local employers. And we have been blown away by the um, the demand from the final year students and graduates to actually go into the regions and experience for themselves because it really does change their perception of what a regional area can offer. Um, not just the job opportunities, but what it's, what it looks like and what it feels like and what the community is like. So, you know, they've met employers and um, about 50 groups of students have gone at once. And, you know, we are now hearing about actual tangible outcomes of students either moving to these regions, they've gained employment, or they're doing their, their nursing placements in, in certain areas. And in fact, there was one uh, one physio student, I think, that on a, the most recent trip to the Limestone Coast, who was who was like the rock star because everyone wanted to employ him. Um, <laughs> you know, there was there was just so many jobs, yeah. and so he he was like the rock star. And then one lady who had a um, I think a wellbeing and and uh, mental health practice, you know, grabbed a group of ten students and walked them down the street, you know, from the town hall or wherever they were meeting. 
you know, just basically put her arms around them, walk them down the street to show them what it was like, you know, what her practice was like. So um, the feedback that we've had about um, the interaction between the community and the students has been has been wonderful. And in fact, these students have also opened opened the eyes to, to those possibilities as well. Now, when the, the market is going to get recover, whatever happens, you know, we've got to learn to live with COVID one way or another and the international student market will recover. Um, do you think the uh, the mix will remain the same, uh, Colin? Uh, you know, China has obviously dominated in terms of numbers and maybe to a certain extent India. Um, do you think that will continue or? It's a very, uh, education is a globally competitive um, field. Um, and we're seeing certainly China is growing as a destination country for international education um, with students from many countries now going into China to study in Chinese institutions. Uh, and clearly that's a very deliberate strategy from uh, the Chinese um, government. Um, but again, for, in terms of outgoing um, students and students coming to Australia, Australia does remain a very, um, a very prominent uh, destination choice uh, for uh, many countries. Uh, and we need to make sure that we don't um, poison that well uh, by being too slow uh, or making it too difficult to mm -hmm. reopen. Mm -hmm. um, because if it's too difficult, there are other places to go. Mm -hmm. Canada is, is, you know, has been snapping at our heels for years mm -hmm. uh, and is very proactively encouraging international students to study in Canada. Uh, the UK the same, uh, uh, always has been very competitive in that area. Uh, so we need to make sure that, that a parent, and you know, th think of those parents that have sent their kids to school yeah. mm -hmm. and haven't seen them for two years, yeah. you know, as they're doing the studies. Same for university education. And think of the parent who's thinking, well, where am I going to send, uh, you know, little Jenny or Johnny or, or whoever? Um, and will I send them to Australia? Well, Australia can shut down for two years and, you know, they might spend two years studying there and then not be able to complete. Mm. And that's actually quite a risk. Mm. So we need to demonstrate that we're open uh, and we're, you know, we're, we're, we're freely open and we're welcoming. Mm. One of the things uh, sort of the community debates is, is uh, uh, Karen, is the, that sort of balance between security considerations at a, at a national level and the attractiveness of international students and so on. And, mm. um, you know, there's all sorts of questions about defence and infiltration and and all the rest. Um, where do you think that balance lies? And maybe, um, you know, where do international students sit in terms of the actual defense of the country, in terms of creating relationships and, and friendships with people? Well, I think one of the, perhaps one of the less understood benefits of, of international education has is this what we call soft diplomacy. So the connections that international students offer back to um, those countries and other parts of the world that um, is just is it's just amazing. Um, in fact, you know, you talk about diversity and I would argue that actually this sector is extremely diverse given we have students from 120 countries here. And um, if you look at even our top 10 countries and the difference that you know, in our market mix from uh, traditional exports is incredible. You know, Vietnam's in the top 10, Nepal's in the top 10, even Brazil um, is in the top 10. So the ability to, and, and so if you have hundreds or thousands of students from those countries, there's hundreds and thousands of families that we are instantly connected to if we take that opportunity. And I think we can all talk about people we have met on our travels um, that have talk about the, the time they've studied in Australia or Adelaide. And they, you know, if anyone's ever lived overseas they and they've had a good experience, you always have a connection with that place. And I think that's um, an amazing opportunity for South Australia in particular. As Wendy said, you know, we do have, we, we feel very comfortable here and we mm -hmm. it's very easy to feel uh, safe in our little spot down here in the Southern Hemisphere, but um, we're, we're globally connected. So these students are making enormous contributions across a number of sectors. And I, and I acknowledge there is, you know, there's certain sectors such as events, but there are so many other sectors such as health that are crying out for, you know, the skills that they bring. Mm. Now we've been looking there at a uh, certain extent, uh, the effect of COVID on international students, but obviously COVID's having a major um, effect on 
um, our domestic students and staff. Now, the um, Victoria has moved to make it compulsory for um, staff to, to staff and students to be vaccinated, and I think uh, University of New South Wales just announced today um, the same. Um, so. Is that something that's going to be inevitable here? Well, certainly, you know, your counterpart, uh, Colin Peter Hoy at uh, University of Adelaide has said um, it's not a thing, not a decision that the university should make individually. It's a, it's a conversation that the, the whole community has got to have um, and the universities would be part of that. So do you, do you think it's in, inevitable that um, there'll be some sort of vaccination requirement? Look, let me just put my cards on the table. You know, I think absolutely everyone uh, should be vaccinated with the exception of, you know, those who may have some medical reason as to why they ought not to be, um, such as an allergy or, or whatever. Um, w it, the best way to protect ourselves from this, um, you know, lethal pandemic uh, are these marvellous vaccines that are being created in record time. Uh, uh, can we make them um, compulsory? You know, I would love to, but as an employer, speaking as an employer, there are certain difficulties around that at this moment in time, and specifically in a state where effectively there's no circulating virus, right? It's very different in Victoria or New South Wales at this particular moment in time. Uh, and that actually changes the dynamic quite significantly. Uh, and in order to protect uh, our staff uh, and our students, um, uh, then uh, encouraging vaccination, I think, is, a, is crucially important and potentially mandating it at some point down the line. I would say that, you know, the resistance that we see to vaccination is, you know, um, uh, profoundly um, misplaced. Uh, and it is also, from a public health perspective, from a societal perspective, it is um, deeply selfish. Uh, and what we, what people need to understand is that every unvaccinated person becomes a potential pool for the growth of virus. An individual gets infected with this virus, they'll produce 10 to the 11 new viral particles, right? That's 10,000 billion new particles. Uh, and every single one of them has the potential to be a new variant. So every single infection is a potential source of a new variant of COVID. Uh, and we don't want to see any new variants. We don't want to see variants that might be able to evade the vaccines that have presently been created. So as a public good, we should, we should be insisting on folks getting vaccinated. I like to think in the university sector, um, you know, we are, you know, I, the, this, the, the population that work in universities are, you know, highly educated, you know, they, they can examine facts, generally speaking, you know, incredibly well. Uh, and so, you know, I'd expect them to look at the evidence and make their own decision. Um, so now you, you were talking with your geneticist hat on, <laughs> I think, weren't you, in terms of... Indeed, but yeah. it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an absolute reality. That's what happens. The, mm. the more you let a virus uh, develop, the more you let it grow, the more opportunities you give it to, to, to change and to, to then find new ways to infect. And that's why it's a very important program of work that's going on, uh, which is around the provision of of vaccine to less wealthy countries mm. because we will not protect ourselves from COVID by merely vaccinating every Australian. Uh, we will protect mm. the planet from COVID by vaccinating uh, the globe, frankly. Do you think we're being too soft on people? Like there's a sort of this idea that you have freedom of choice, you can be vaccinated or not vaccinated. Well, we don't offer that freedom of choice to people if they get into a motor car and they want to drive, they have to have a driving license. It, it, uh, why, why is there this difference? Like if you're going to do something that potentially will harm somebody else in the workplace, why, why, why are we not being strict in enforcing it? I mean, I think the, you know, the, there are some clearly profound implications around whether or not one could ever contemplate forcing an injection upon someone you know that's an in, that's that would be a pretty interesting world if we lived in that one and i don't think i'd even want to live in that particular world if they want to make that choice make the choice but they need to understand the consequences of that choice uh, and for me i think you know we i mean i'll declare i'm double vaccinated astrazeneca um you know i i think that 
if a large percentage of the population remain unvaccinated, there's the risk from COVID. They will also clog up every ICU bed. I mean, they'll, they'll all catch COVID sometime in the next two years. And a significant number will wind up in ICU intubated. And every ICU bed in the city or the country will be occupied. And then other folks, you know, who've done the right thing, who wind up needing an ICU bed for some other reason, won't be able to get one. That's, that's fundamentally selfish. Mm. Uh, and I do think we need to probably better educate um, uh, in order to make sure that folks understand that these myths around vaccination are exactly that. Uh, and to, to clarify what the safety, the, 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 the fact that these vaccines are safe. Um, but, you know, mandating is, is, you know, a bit of a, a bit of a minefield. Mm. Now, just one of the questions that's come in from uh, the audience. And again, just a reminder that if you do want to put in a question, use the uh, Twitter hashtag, uh, Fearless Conversations. Um, so a question from Stefano, and it's uh, to you, Colin. Um, apparently, um, yeah, there, there is a question about Flinders University and uh, the teaching of Italian um, is potentially to be phased out. Um, is that correct? And if so, why? And isn't sort of provision of um, teaching of foreign languages really one of the essential things that the uni should be doing? I mean, there's been no decision made in that regard at this moment in time. Um, there is, though, a discussion going on around that particular um, subject area uh, and, and several others. Uh, and the, the important factor for us is that, and this isn't a COVID phenomenon, no, yeah. this is a phenomenon that's been running for several years now, which is that there aren't very many students studying certain subjects. Uh, and sometimes some of those subjects are, have remarkably small numbers of students enrolled. Uh, and there does come a point uh, when, uh, as an institution, as we're facing significant financial pressures, mainly actually from the Commonwealth Government and the changes in the Job Ready Graduates program uh, or the Job Ready Graduates funding uh, model uh, that frankly mean universities will have to do very much more with very much less into the future. Uh, and that means we have to look at every course we teach that's losing money and ask whether we can continue that or not. Uh, and that's the discussion that's happening at the minute with that particular area. So j just talking about that, uh, yeah, the federal government funding so and the job ready package. So um, certainly you're, they've said you've got to have more places, but less per head of student on average. And if you look at the funding packages, the... Um, from the federal government, they're increasing funding to schools, but they seem to be tightening up on funding to universities if you exclude uh, student loans. So already, already um, private schools get more money uh, than universities and um, public schools are on a trajectory to be getting more money out of uh, the federal government than, than universities. Again, saying excluding loans that get paid back. Um, why do you think that's happening? And, and, and you know, is that a Obviously, public schools would, would welcome any more money, Wendy, but do you think that that's, um, that's something that the community understands is happening? And why, why do you think that's happening, that more money is going into schools and not some, you know, the increases to universities is not keeping pace? I think it's really important if we want to be a, a civilised, highly developed country that we fund education really appropriately, whether it's school education or university education. I think it actually has to be a really high priority because we know if we have well-educated citizens, we actually have a strong democracy. And one of the challenges for us currently in Australia is, do we have a strong democracy? So that's a particular issue in terms of the priority prioritization of various governments in terms of funding. And we know that David Gonski quite some time ago talked about how we need to rethink the funding to schools in particular. And I guess it's a, a challenge for schools, particularly government schools, where they can't get the funding for a coat of paint on their school and they look across the road to a private school and they see it establishing a $40 million sports complex with an indoor pool, squash courts, et cetera. So 
We don't want to develop a rivalry between public and private schools, but what we do want is we want all of our schools to be properly funded. Now, the challenge is the pie for funding is only so big. So where do you find the funding in order to make sure that every school has the appropriate funding and every university has the appropriate funding? And so the challenge is, does the federal government continue to fund private schools? And right at the beginning of this conversation, you talked about the comparison between our results in something like NAPLAN or SACE or uh, TIMS or whatever, uh, compared to other countries. And what we know is that many other countries in the world don't have mm. a private school system like we have, or if they do have a private school system, it's funded by the people who actually attend the private school. And we know that in Australia, we've long had the argument that, oh, the private school families are taxpayers too. My position, and like Colin and his bias in terms of Flinders, I have a really strong bias in terms of government education. I think that basically a government's role is to fund government schools. And then if you as a taxpayer don't want your young person to go to a government school, then you pay for that privilege of making a different sort of choice. I know that many of my colleagues won't agree in terms of across education generally, but I think the time has come for governments to seriously think about how they're funding their state school systems and how they're funding their university systems. In, in light of that, do you think people would be a bit surprised that some of the the public schools that are in sort of uh, basically wealthier socio-economic areas like Glenunga, like, uh, you know, the eastern suburbs here, uh, Marriottville, Norwood, Murray Alta, that if you combine the, the federal and state funding that's going to your school per head of population, that um, taxpayers are paying more per head of population per head of stu per student to some private schools. Do you think people would be surprised by that? I think it varies enormously, Chris. Mm. I think there are a number of people who know about it, who are very angry about it, but who feel powerless to actually change it. I think there's also a range of people who are not interested in how you fund schools mm. and a range of other people who would be interested if we were able to promote it. And often we're our our own worst enemies. We're so polite about things that we don't want to kind of rush to the barricades and talk about how you fund schools. Instead, we do it in a very polite fashion. And as a result, um, taxpayers or people generally actually don't necessarily get the message because they're used to having messages pummeled into them mm. by social media, as opposed to the kind of polite way that we kind of talk about the issues that we have. And then the argument, uh, you know, certainly many politicians raise, oh, it's not about just putting in more money into, into schools, that, um, you know, the class sizes don't matter so much. It's, um, you know, what, if you had more money in public schools, what, what would the money be spent on? What, how can, would it improve things? Yeah, I understand that putting more money in doesn't necessarily get you great outcomes. So you have to be very careful about where you're putting your money. But the issue for us is that in many other advanced countries of the world, they give their teachers paid time to do the preparation and to work collaboratively to deliver the best outcomes possible to our students. Now, in a secondary school like ours, our teachers have five classes each, and it means they're responsible for 150 students. Now, being responsible for 150 students, they do a wonderful job, but they'd do a so much better job if they actually had time to prepare for those classes. So from my perspective, it's not about smaller class sizes. It's actually about smaller teaching loads so that teachers can have time to do what they do in many other countries of the world, Singapore, Finland, for example, and that is to prepare collaboratively to deliver the best education possible to our young people. And then people say, oh, well, teachers get all that uh, holiday time and that, why aren't they spending, you know, they get paid a full-time wage. Yes, why don't they? but I think people are changing their tune, Chris, since homeschooling came into <laughs> yeah. play. Because what I say to parents who say that is, would you like to spend um, five hours with 30 adolescents and be trying to get an outcome 
from each one of those adolescents. <laughs> and people who have teenage children say, oh, look, I'm having trouble managing one or two, yeah. let alone 30. Mm -hmm. So the reason why teachers actually need the holidays that they've got is because they have to replenish their batteries to be able to deal with that 150 students that they have for the 10 or 11 weeks of term. It's a hugely draining exercise to teach really well. And in terms of the uh, funding, but, but at the personal level now, the, the, um, the job ready graduates reforms have gone through and um, they have made some, the idea was to push students into choosing courses where supposedly there were more jobs like uh, uh, teaching and some of the health professions and make some of the other courses more expensive and therefore less attractive to the students. At a school level, um, are people, is that proving to be a consideration? When you, when you talk to mixed, your students? Yeah, so. it's a mixed response. For most of our students, they're intent on pursuing their passion. So if they have a passion for a course that's now become more highly uh, expensive, uh, they'll still pursue it. And I think for a lot of young people, they don't think about too far into the future. They're actually thinking about what course do I want to get into and I'll worry about paying off the loan later. Mm -hmm. For other families with significant financial difficulties, it is a really tough choice. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a, a real challenge for us in terms of making uh, funding for different courses at university so different based on the job market. Because as Colin said earlier, going to university isn't about just preparing for the job market, it's actually preparing to be a good citizen of a strong democracy. And if we don't have universities doing that, if we don't have schools doing that, Australia grows weaker. Yes. And we can't afford Australia to grow weaker in terms of its democratic principles. Mm. And one of the changes at university level um, is instead of uh, students coming in and doing a whole three, four year degree, um, they're coming in and, and just doing a micro credential courses, um, just looking at one particular thing and that obviously far less time commitment, far less money commitment. Um, is that a trend that's going to accelerate. Maybe just explain what a micro-credential is, if anyone doesn't understand. I mean, it's essentially a, a short course, um, something that might, it might be a week, it might be a month, it might be six months, but, but a short course. Uh, we, we do a number. Uh, some of them are for, for qualifications, like diplomas and so forth, uh, that are really very, very successful. Um, uh, and we've done a few in recent times around uh, digital manufacturing, for example, that has been hugely successful. Um, one advantage to those types of courses is that they enable us to, to bring in um, people who, may, who might already be in the workforce, who are looking for a, a short um, upskilling uh, course that, in, that, that opens some new opportunity for them in their, in their job or in a new career. Um, and these would be individuals who couldn't afford to go back to university necessarily for a whole another three years, years to do another degree. Um, uh, and so I think it's actually a very important uh, uh, workforce uh, development um, tool, yeah. tool, actually, uh, that we should use more of. Uh, it doesn't mean that we stop doing the longer degree uh, because those degrees are, you know, they, they bring a different type of value in the development, in the, in the earlier development, if you like, of, of, uh, of younger people. But do you, do you think it's, it's, a, it's a, an offering that's going to grow in numbers? I think we're doing more and more of them. Mm. Um, you know, they are, you know, I think if you can, if you can find the, the right upskilling opportunity uh, and offer it in a very timely fashion to, to, the, to, the, to the market uh, and, you know, people see that it's a, a real opportunity for them to develop their prospects, then, of course, uh, you've got something that's going to be very successful. Now, what are the other things that's sort of on the table in terms of uh, changes that uh, universities are facing is uh, in South Australia is the question of, of mergers. Now, Flinders University is kind of largely seems to have taken a bit of a backseat and it's really most of the debate has been about um, the original proponents of UniSA and, and, and Adelaide. Um, but it is very much uh, on the agenda. It is a policy of the uh, Australian Labor Party, mm -hmm. um, at least to bring the, the, um, the parties together and um, 
to talk about it. Um, David Lloyd from UniSA is in favour of um, bringing the vet sector into the TAFE SA into the into the room as well. Um, wh where do you see that, that that going forward now? Before I answer that, mm. um, I've got this pressing thing in my head because I know that I'm going to criticise for numeracy because I expanded 10 to the 11 incorrectly earlier. I just wanted to see it. <laughs> so that if anyone on Twitter has picked it up already, I just wanted to see it. So, um, uh, I'll, and I'll tweet the right answer later. Um, uh, in terms of university mergers, look, the, it, it's an interesting discussion. Uh, we've been there before. It's interesting that it keeps coming up in South Australia. And I think it says something about the, to me, that speaks to the recognition that the universities are a big part of our economy. Mm -hmm. So there's a desire to be seen to do something about it, right? Whatever that means. Um, what would a, a university merger deliver? Um, one of the arguments is that we'd have somehow a bigger, better institution. Uh, you can do the maths on it in terms of university rankings, and you can say that if you took any two of the three public universities and merged them, uh, you would have a university that would rank more highly in research metrics in some of the global rankings. Um, and that's potentially interesting and potentially worthwhile. There are many, many risks, though, associated with that sort of activity. It is, and having actually been involved in the in one of the mergers that globally that is recognized as probably the most successful university merger internationally which was manchester um you know that was a long and difficult uh, and by no means pain-free process and it was incredibly costly mm -hmm. to make it the success that it was cost billions of pounds mm -hmm. now if we've got billions of dollars to help to make such a process successful, then let's have a conversation. Um, but let's not forget that what we're targeting there are improvements in research rankings. We're not, you, don't even, you don't even change the research that's being done. You simply put it together, bundle in a different package, and it scores more highly. So nothing's changed. So what are, what's the goal? What's the outcome that's going to actually deliver then better performance. Uh, and the area that, would cons that actually I would say we also need to pay particular attention to would be actually competition student choice. Hmm. Students in this state hmm. choose the three different public universities for different reasons, yes. uh, because we offer different things and a different culture and a different experience and different courses. Sometimes we offer the same course. You mentioned law earlier. Uh, I can tell you we compete you know, tooth and nail to make sure that our course, if the others offer it, we make sh we keep on our toes by making sure that we keep updating and improving the thing that we're offering so that it's the thing that students choose. Now that's good for students, right? If we become, you know, if we became some single institution, you know, and we spread the courses out on into different campuses so that you go to one place for law, somewhere else for medicine, you'd have uh, a monoculture that needn't necessarily lead to a, a drop in standards, but to be honest with you, you'd need to work very hard to make sure it didn't. Now, sadly, we're coming to the end of uh, our discussion. So just uh, very briefly, I'd like to ask each of you, what's the one um, thing and you know, very succinctly, one thing that's worrying you most at the moment and, and what you're gonna do to fix it. So, um, calling Christopher Pine perhaps, but um, Karen, with you. Well, I try not to worry about things I can't control, Chris. So there are a number of things outside of our control at the moment. So I guess, you know, the thing that I am, uh, I guess I'm very focused on uh, is how we can support the return of international students. What's the role that Study Adelaide can play in working very closely with our institutions um, and supporting the individual students themselves? Because mm. we, we are, we, and I'm sure the, uh, Flinders and Glenunga and many other providers are also receiving, you know, constant contact with students. So it's how we can best support those students. And Colin? Yeah. Other than my maths error, <laughs> uh, it's probably... We'll forgive you that one. <laughs> <laughs> now, look, it's the, it'll be the, you know, the, the international student return is extremely important. And that's certainly for us, that's not about the money at all. Not at all. 
Um, it's about the, the, the students that we owe something to mm. uh, and also all those future students that we can do so much for. Um, I guess the thing that, that the other challenge that I see the university sector facing at present is the, the loggerheads that we have been at with the federal government uh, and the, the pressure on, uh, to try to increase regulation on the way that universities uh, operate uh, and the, the squeezing of funding and the way that we're going to have to respond very nimbly to ensure that we can um, get through some of those um, um, uh, difficulties. Mm. And Wendy, you have... Well, people may not realise it, but right at the moment, secondary schools are in the midst of a revolution. So you haven't heard the beating of the drums for the revolution, and that is to shift from a 20th century factory model to a 21st century agile, flexible, innovative model of teaching. And we say to our kids, you know, 10, 20 years ago, secondary school was about a sausage factory. You were the sausage casings. We stuffed you full of content. Right moment, squeezed you, blah, out it came. Uh, and now that won't work because all the content you need is on your smartphone. So what we need to teach kids is how to actually use the, what they know in really different settings. And you can't do that by monologuing at, at adolescence. And in the past, we in secondary schools have been really good, particularly in middle class schools, monologuing at kids who sat there and looked like they might be engaged. Meanwhile, their minds were everywhere else. So for us, it's the challenge of actually shifting a whole workforce from a way of doing business to a new way of doing business. And we at Glenunga have been on this transformational journey for the last 10 or 12 years. And the challenge for us is how do we make sure that that learning, that transformation is available to every student undertaking secondary education in South Australia at least, if not in Australia. That's really important for equity's sake that every kid gets an opportunity for a 21st century education. Well, thank you very much. That was Wendy Johnson, um, Principal of Glenanga International High School. And thank you, Colin Sterling from uh, Vice Chancellor of uh, Flinders University and Karen Kent from uh, Study Adelaide, Chief Executive of Study Adelaide. And thank you to our audience for being here to, with us today. If you'd like to review the program, um, you can do so shortly either um, via advertiser.com.au or through uh, the Flinders University site, both this um, number eight in the series uh, and the previous um, Fearless Conversation uh, sessions. Now, tune in again next week at the same time. Uh, next week's uh, Fearless Conversation will be about innovation and entrepreneurship. So thank you very much for joining us. <laughs>